My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway murders Facebook group together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Welcome to our first episode of the 2022 season. Can you believe it's 2022 already, Bill Thomas? I can't. I guess the first thing we should do is wish everybody a happy new year and hope that 2022 is better than, oh, I don't know, 2021 or maybe 2020. (laughs) It's got to be better, doesn't it? You would think at some point or another, it would start to get better. And I will say that 2021 did not come close to the dumpster fire of 2020. It was rough, but I feel like it wasn't as bad as 2020. So that's your way of saying you think we're headed in the right direction? I think so. Yeah, I think we're still going to have hiccups up and down the road. But yeah, I'm going to I'm going to choose optimism for 2022. Well, speaking of good news in 2021, Ghislaine Maxwell guilty on five of six charges. I may have jumped up and down and threw my fist in the air and screamed a little bit when I heard that. Maybe. I'm not saying I did. I am saying maybe I did. No one has video of this either, but I may have done a happy dance Yeah, and jumped around a little bit. I'm so thrilled because Jeffrey Epstein may no longer be with us. Part of me thanks God for that. It feels good to see at least one of the many guilty parties associated with this sex trafficking ring, which is really what it was, finally brought to justice. And I hope we'll see more of that sort of thing in the new year. Yes, agreed. I'm not going to lie. I was starting to sweat a little bit because the jury was taking so long. But we did have a very astute listener on our Mind Over Murder page, Leona, who explained why she thought it was taking so long and the fact that she thought that was a good thing, that the jury was dotting the I's, crossing the T's, making sure there was not a lot of room for appeal. I hadn't thought of it that way. So when she mentioned it, I was like, okay. I get that. I can see that. I'm going to take the optimistic road now. I found myself worrying as well. And I also was trying to interpret, as I know millions of other people were too, why they were asking for revisiting particular pieces of evidence. They had to send notes out to the judge saying, could you please send us this testimony or that testimony so they could go back and reread it. It was hard to kind of read the tea leaves about Mm -hmm. what it was the jury was thinking about, but they were careful and methodical. And we had an outstanding outcome. Ghislaine Maxwell was found guilty on five of six charges. And she's looking at perhaps 65 years. She just turned 60 on Christmas Day. Things go according to plan. She'll be 125 when she gets out of jail. Couldn't happen to a nicer person, honestly. (laughs) I mean, if you want to be flip about it. Honestly, though, the big question on everyone's minds now is, will she appeal? Probably. And will she talk? Which I think she will if she thinks that it will get her a reduced sentence. I think she will talk. I hope she does. Her family has announced that they will appeal. So that process could take some time. I'm not 100% certain whether she will attempt to plea down her sentence at this point or wait until after the appeal because she could be looking at incredibly long years in prison. Obviously, the whole thing could be overturned on appeal, but I doubt it. A lot of interesting facets of this case in the days and weeks ahead as the appeals process moves forward. And we will keep you all updated as warranted as the case moves forward. Very interesting development, and this was recorded on Thursday. The BBC made the highly questionable choice of having Alan Dershowitz on as an expert and failed to mention that Alan Dershowitz is a suspect, a person of interest, has been named in at least one lawsuit, the lawsuit that's currently 
making its way through the courts uh, that was filed as a civil lawsuit by Virginia Giuffre, she specifically states and has said so repeatedly that Alan Dershowitz raped her. And yet the BBC put Dershowitz on the air where he proceeded to insist that Virginia Giuffre's civil suit was weakened Although he did reference her, including him in the people that she says raped her when she was an underage victim of Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, the BBC has just shown horrific judgment in putting him on the air in this way. And there is going to be an inquiry within the BBC hierarchy to find out exactly who showed such atrocious judgment as to put an interested party and perhaps even a guilty party Mm -hmm. on their air with the stamp of approval that the BBC News carries worldwide. I was just shocked that they did this and they seem to be taking a fair amount of flack and every bit of it is deserved. I agree at 100%. So that will be interesting too in the days and weeks ahead to figure out what precisely happened there to allow Mr. Dershowitz on the air with regard to that. I noticed a certain tone of disdain when you called him Mr. Dershowitz. Yeah, there may have been a little bit of that there. (laughs) Maybe, just a little. We'll keep you posted on what we learn via our social media pages and, of course, here on the Mind Over Murder podcast. There were a lot of really great true crime stories that happen right toward the end of the year, and unfortunately, we can't report on every single one of them as they happen. One of the stories that piqued my interest that I am very happy to be able to get to at the moment was a series of exonerations long overdue in many, many cases. And the one that we would like to focus on today is the exoneration of Anthony Broadwater, 61 years old, who was exonerated in late November of the 1981 rape of Alice Sebold, who would go on to become a best-selling author in later years. Some of you who are familiar with her work may know her as the author of The Lovely Bones, which was also turned into a hit film in 2010. And she is also the author of a memoir, Lucky, which is about the rape that she underwent when she was a college freshman in 1981. So Mr. Broadwater was exonerated of the rape of Alice Sebold, for which he went to jail for 16 years. So we would like to get into coverage on this particular story. I think this case highlights a number of issues that are worth discussing. It's a fascinating case. It's ultimately a tragic case on some level. And it's a very, very interesting jumping off point for some of the issues that we've discussed before here on Mind Over Murder. We'll do what we usually do, which is Mr. Thomas will provide his color commentary on all aspects of the case while I do some reporting out and also offer my commentary as well. This is a pretty complex case with a lot of interesting characters, so we're going to go ahead and jump in and see if we can cover this in one episode. So Anthony Broadwater is currently 61 years old, and in late November, he was exonerated for this rape of which he was accused and ultimately convicted. What happened took place in May of 1981, and that is when Alice Sebold, who was a college freshman, she was just finishing up her freshman year at Syracuse University, was attacked and raped in Thorndon Park when she was on her way home from an off-campus party. It was the end of the year. She was with some friends celebrating, and she decided to walk home through the park to get back to her dorm. As she was making her way through the park, Alice Sebold was grabbed from behind. She was punched and hit in the head. She was threatened with a knife. She was pulled into a tunnel by her hair, and she was brutally, and I do mean brutally, raped. We are not going to get into the graphic details of what happened to Alice Sebold because it is very graphic, very brutal, and would likely be traumatizing for people who have undergone sexual crimes and sexual trauma. She recounts those graphic details in her memoir, Lucky, which was released in 1999. If you are interested in those details, you can find Lucky at your local library. You probably will not, however, be able to find it at a local bookstore as Scribner's, the publisher, has pulled it from the shelves in lieu of Mr. Broadwater's exoneration for that crime. 
So if you are interested in those details, you will probably have to find the book at your local library or maybe on an e-reading service, but it is not available in bookstores at the moment. But again, we do want to warn you that it is extremely hard to read. I have read it. And uh, one of the articles that we read as research for this particular episode did revisit some of those details. It is incredibly difficult. So if you are planning on reading, please do take care uh, and understand that there is a lot of detail in there that is probably very traumatizing for people who have undergone similar circumstances. So in May 8th of 1981, after Alice Sebald was attacked in Thorndon Park, she did immediately go to the hospital. She also reported the crime to police and campus security. She did this right away. It was possible for a rape kit to be collected at the hospital. That does mean that there is physical evidence in this case, or there was in 1981. Whether there still is a rape kit or a physical evidence recovery kit, uh, whether that is still available is, I think, something that Uh, Mr. Broadwater's lawyers would have to look into. But there was evidence taken from Ms. Sebald because she had been not only raped, but also physically beaten during the process. She also worked with police to compile a composite sketch of her attacker. She described being face-to-face with her attacker. In fact, she described herself as being only centimeters away from her attacker's face. So she did work with police to generate a composite sketch. However, the resulting sketch did not actually resemble her attacker, like not to her satisfaction. That ended up becoming a little bit of a problem uh, moving forward in this case. So after Sebald reported the attack and uh, a rape kit was taken and a composite sketch was built up, unfortunately, there was not much movement on the case. The police were not able to find her attacker. Five months after the attack, Alyssa Bold's walking down the street, and she thought that she spied her attacker. She reported to police that as he walked past her, he said, don't I know you from somewhere, which she took to be a, a taunt. So after reporting to the police that she thought she had seen her attacker, who she identified as Anthony Broadwater. Anthony Broadwater was arrested and taken to the police station where he was placed in a lineup. Before we get into what happened when Mr. Broadwater was taken to the police station, I want to make sure we get a little bit of background also on Mr. Broadwater. At the time of Alice Sebald's attack, Anthony Broadwater was 20 years old, so two years older than she was. He had returned home to Syracuse after being stationed with the Marine Corps at 29 Palms and Camp Pendleton in California. He had received a medical discharge and disability because he had a cyst on his wrist. And so he was no longer associated with the Marine Corps and he went home to Syracuse. His father at that time was undergoing treatment for stomach cancer, so he also felt it was important to be home to help assist his father. So he returned to Syracuse, and at the time of Alice Sebald's rape, he was installing telephones with a telecommunications company. Mr. Broadwater was arrested. He was placed in a police lineup with other Black men. It should be noted at this point that Alice Sebald is a white woman and Mr. Broadwater is a black man. So he was placed into a lineup along with other men and Alice Sebald was brought in and asked if she could identify her attacker. She picked number five in the lineup as her attacker. Here's the problem. Anthony Broadwater was not number five. Anthony Broadwater was number four in the lineup. An hour later, when Sebald was asked to confirm her choice, that yes, as a matter of fact, number five was her attacker, she picked number four and sort of seesawed back and forth. And she said, well, she thought both of the men looked identical. And so she ultimately picked Mr. Broadwater out of the lineup when she was asked to identify her attacker a second time. I find myself shaking my head because already, even at this early stage, you're seeing all kinds of problems here. She identified Mr. Broadwater five months after the fact while walking down the street. She's white. He's black. As you have pointed out, we often see cross-racial misidentification happening in situations like this. 
even this idea that number four looks like number five is another red flag. Yeah. She's basically saying, and I know she's a frightened 18 year old young woman, but she's basically saying two black men look identical to her. Yes. Now we don't have photographs and we're not looking at the people that were designated number four and number five, but it's yet another problem in the early going of this case. There is a photograph of that lineup in one of the New York Times articles that I took a look at, but I don't see they look identical when I look at number four and number five. But again, as you pointed out, she is a scared, traumatized 18-year-old girl. I can see misidentifications happening. It's not right. I don't agree with it, but I can see how it might have happened. This next little bit of information here is one of the red flags that would ultimately lead to Mr. Broadwater's exoneration. And I'm actually going to read this straight from the New York Times articles that I used to do my research for this. Quote, in her memoir, Lucky, Sebold revealed an interaction between herself and a prosecutor named Gail Eubelhauer, which would prove key in Broadwater's exoneration. Eubelhauer told her that the man she identified in the lineup was a friend of Mr. Broadwater and had tricked her by staring menacingly. According to the book, Ms. Eubelhauer then coached her into explaining away the misidentification in front of the grand jury. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And as you had said before, according to the Innocence Project and various other groups that work on exoneration cases, misidentification by eyewitnesses does make up the bulk of wrongful convictions especially when those misidentifications are cross-racial. You already have a big red flag here, as you said. And a reminder for our listeners, this is 1981, and this is well before DNA is used in forensic examination of rape kits and other evidence. So although it's not that long ago, it's the dark ages in terms of DNA is not even a thing yet until the late 1980s. 40 years ago. After Sebald picked out Mr. Broadwater in a lineup, he was arrested on eight felony counts, including rape and sodomy. And Mr. Broadwater was very eager to cooperate with the DA's office, however, because he knew that this was a mix up. He felt that the mix up could easily be fixed once he had a chance to tell his side of the story. So he worked incredibly closely and was very forthcoming about all aspects of his side of the story in this case. His public defender was a district attorney named Stephen Packett. He worked with clients who required the services of a public defender because Syracuse did not have a public defender system. They just picked lawyers who were willing to work with clients who needed one. I also note Uh, that Mr. Packett was about 26 years old at the time that he acted as the public defender, keeping in mind if he went to college and then law school, he only had about two or three years experience. Quote, Mr. Packett found Mr. Broadwater to be unusual because he was intensely eager about cooperating with the district attorney's office. Quote, he was emphatic throughout that they got the wrong guy, recalled Mr. Packett, now 66. It was a disbelief coupled with a faith that once the facts were out, justice would be done for him. And that I find a particularly heartbreaking quote, because as we realize, there are major flaws in our criminal justice system. And as the case would play out, we know that justice, unfortunately, would not be done for him until 40 years later. Packett ultimately encouraged Mr. Broadwater to seek what's called a bench trial in front of Judge Walter Gorman, who in Syracuse legal circles was considered to be a very fair judge. For anybody who is not aware of what a bench trial is, a bench trial is not in front of a jury. The judge receives the facts. The judge imposes the sentence as opposed to having a jury do it. Packett said, look, let's just put this in front of a judge. We don't need a jury. Let's just present the facts and we'll, you know, fix this. We'll we'll get you cleared, exonerated, and off we go. The bench trial went forward. It lasted two days, starting on May 17th, ending on May 19th. 
At this point, I need to interject. I see two massive red flags here. The bench trial is a tremendous mistake because a jury would have probably been much more thoughtful in their analysis of the evidence presented. And then the fact that a rape trial, what should be a complicated, nuanced, thoughtful presentation of the facts somehow is done in two days. There are so many problems with this conviction. As you make your way through the story, Kristen, I just find myself wincing. This Mm -hmm. is one problem after another. It really, really is. Ultimately, the case against Mr. Broadwater hinged on two things. Number one, Ms. Sebold's identification of Mr. Broadwater from the lineup, which we already know was problematic. And number two was microscopic hair comparison, which at this point, 40 years later, has been debunked as a junk science. As you reminded our listeners earlier, Bill, there was no DNA testing available in 1982. It just was not a thing. Hair comparison is all that was available. So a forensic chemist took the stand and stated that a pubic hair found on Ms. Sebald was consistent with the hair sample that Mr. Broadwater submitted. But that doesn't mean anything other than the fact that the two hairs looked similar. And so hair comparison, as, as I said a minute ago, has been debunked as a junk science. It is something that is not reliable. And in fact, when Mr. Broadwater's lawyers started looking at a number of cases in Syracuse that had resulted in wrongful conviction, they found that a number of them had relied on that hair comparison. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Some of our listeners may recall that in an earlier episode of Mind Over Murder, we had discussed the fact that the FBI lab in Washington, D.C., actually Quantico, Virginia, trained most of the pathologists around the country in this junk science of hair. And several years ago, hundreds and hundreds of cases were overturned as a result of further analysis of this junk science coming out of the FBI lab at Quantico regarding hair evidence. So this has been largely discredited since then. This is yet another example of a situation where someone has been convicted based on on very specious grounds. I mean, both samples from an African-American man, and that might be all they really had. That's certainly what it sounded like to me. Ms. Sibyl took the stand to testify against Mr. Broadwater. She um, reported that she was shaking and sweating the entire time that she was on the stand, but she did ultimately identify Mr. Broadwater as the man who raped her without a doubt. Mr. Broadwater took the stand to testify in his own defense. One of the things his lawyer asked him to discuss when he was on the stand was the scars that he had on his face because he had several prominent ones. He had one under his chin. He had some scars from an operation that he'd had on his eye in the 70s, and he did have a chipped tooth. Now, the lawyer pointed out that Ms. Sebold had never mentioned these in her identification of her attacker, even though she said she was within centimeters of her attacker and could therefore identify his face. So not only do we have an early sketch prepared that doesn't look anything like Mr. Broadwater. And then we have a misidentification in the lineup where she suspects it's number five in the lineup and it's actually number four. She's picked the wrong man in the lineup. And then there's no mention of the fact that Mr. Broadwater does have some very distinguishing features, two scars as well as this chipped tooth, which have never come out in any of the descriptions she's provided. This whole thing is a disaster. The point was also made that the DA emphasized maybe rather too much to the judge that Alice Sibold had been a virgin when she was raped in an attempt to elicit some sympathy. The judge, Judge Walter Gorman, ruled almost immediately, which was a surprise to everyone in the courtroom, didn't require a whole lot of time to think about this. 
he did find Mr. Broadwater guilty of rape in the first degree. And he did not discuss his decision beyond that. Like he didn't offer any insight as to why he made the ruling. He just made the ruling. I don't think you would have seen this happen had there been a jury of his peers in the room. I think the conviction process, should it have come to that, would have been a much more thoughtful, analytical, careful process had he been judged by 12 of his peers in a proper courtroom proceeding. I agree with that assessment. Mr. Broadwater was so certain that he was going to walk out of the courtroom a free man that he had not invited family or friends to the trial in support. He just figured justice was going to do what it was going to do. So unfortunately, he ended up being arrested and leaving the courtroom. No family, no friends, no one there to support him. And again, I think that Stephen Paquette, his public defender, this is just a disaster. I mean, the fact that he let Mr. Broadwater be railroaded in this way is unbelievable. So ultimately, Mr. Broadwater served 16 years in prison. During that time, he got his GED. He studied the law because he wanted to reopen his case. During that time, he saved as much money as he could. Um, And at one point, once he was out of jail and was saving money, he even sent $1,000 to Johnny Cochran because he wanted Mr. Cochran to represent him. Mr. Cochran's firm did send back the money because they said Mr. Cochran did not handle post-conviction cases and would not be interested in taking on this case. Now, during his 16 years in prison, Mr. Broadwater did come up for parole a number of times, but each time he refused to admit guilt, as he should have, because he knew that he had done nothing wrong. He did know that he would be more likely to earn parole if he took responsibility for the crime that he had been convicted of, but he didn't do it because he knew that he wasn't guilty. So he served 16 years, ultimately being released in uh, 1999, which is the same year that Lucky came out. The New York Times did a very interesting series of articles recently where they discussed this issue that individuals who feel that they've been wrongfully convicted have run into problems as they move their way through their sentences in receiving parole because they've refused to admit guilt for crimes that they feel that they were improperly convicted for. It's a very sad and kind of bizarre catch-22 that these men are left to rot in jail for crimes that they may not have actually committed because they refuse to admit guilt even though that might result in them being paroled and being allowed to return to society. Many of these men are in prison for decades, and it's a very interesting kind of quandary that some of these men find themselves in, which is, do I admit something that I am rock solid in maintaining my innocence if that would facilitate my being released? It's a very interesting and sad question. Oh, absolutely. Now, ultimately, once he was released in, I think I said 1999 a few minutes ago, I meant 1998, my apologies. He was required to register as a sex offender, which comes with its own set of problems. He ended up being barred from a number of potential workplaces because of his conviction. So he mainly took jobs at night because he couldn't find much else. As a result of his registration as a sex offender, his computer usage had to be monitored. And so he basically just said, I I don't want to learn how to use one. It's fine. I, I don't need to learn one less hassle to keep up with. He did ultimately marry his girlfriend, whose name is Elizabeth, a year after he was released from prison. Uh, After much discussion, the two opted not to have children because they did not want the stigma of his conviction to taint their children's lives, which is a very brave but really heartbreaking choice to have to make. Now, throughout the years, Mr. Broadwater continued to hope that someone would re-examine his case. He struggled to raise enough money to hire a lawyer to re-examine it. In one instance, he was in a car accident that left him with a neck injury, and he saved the entire $30,000 payout in the hopes that that would be enough money for a lawyer to take on his case. 
that he just couldn't find anyone who was willing to take on this post-conviction case. So he just kept moving forward, hoping that at some point or another, there would be someone who would take on his case, re-examine it, and clear his name. Enter Timothy Mucciante, who is a pretty (laughs) colorful character in his own right. A lot of uh, a lot of the reporting that I've read had left out particular details about Mr. Mucciante's background. And so when I finally got the full story on this guy, I was kind of shaking my head going, wow, what a colorful character. Timothy Mucciante is a film producer. He was not always. In fact, he is a former felon with multiple stints in jail. He took an interest in this case because he was involved in the film production of Lucky, which was being filmed for Netflix. And he basically was reading over the memoir and felt that there was something there that wasn't quite gelling. And it wasn't Alice Sebald's account of her rape. He felt like that was true, that that rang true to him. But he felt there was something weird in the court case. And so he decided that he wanted to hire a private detective to look into it. A little background on Mr. Mucciante. As we mentioned, he is a former felon. He is a disbarred lawyer from the state of Michigan who had been in prison on multiple occasions for fraud. I'm going to quote from the New York Times here because I just can't think of a way to say it any better than this. Quote, his most wild scheme was one in which he convinced investors he would buy condoms and latex gloves and trade them in Russia for chickens that would be sold in Saudi Arabia. He pocketed that money instead. (laughs) I absolutely love this scheme (laughs) with the condoms and gloves and the chickens and ultimately selling the chickens in Saudi Arabia. It's a it's just too good to be true. How do you approach someone with that? <laughs> like, I really am sort of struggling here to figure out how you got anybody to invest in that. Well, what a fantastic imagination and what a good person ultimately for Mr. Broadwater to find in his corner. Yes. After he finished his final stint in prison in 2010, he was actively looking for a way to reform himself. So he started that film production company and he had been working, as I mentioned, on this film of Lucky. So in preparation for it, he read the book. He said that he had a number of questions about the case that did not add up for him. So in June, he decided to hire Dan Myers, who is a 20-year veteran of the Onondaga County Sheriff's Office, who at that point was working as a private investigator. And he went to Myers and said, this isn't adding up for me. Can we look into this further? At which point Myers said, yeah, we we can look into this. So he directed uh, Mr. Mucciante and Mr. Broadwater to David Hammond, who is a criminal defense lawyer. If you're familiar with his name at all, it would be because he represented Chelsea Manning during her espionage appeal. They presented the information to Mr. Hammond, who said, okay, I think we can look into this. He, in turn, reached out to a friend of his, Melissa Swartz, with whom he had worked on previous cases and who held an expertise in forensics in particular. And when the two of them began to look into the case, they realized exactly what you did, Bill, pretty quickly. There is a lot of evidence that they could use to appeal this conviction. I'm going to go ahead and again quote from the New York Times article here, quote, after talking at length with Mr. Broadwater and reading Ms. Sebald's memoir, the lawyers discovered the arguments they could make for exoneration were astonishingly obvious. The flawed hair comparison testimony, the heavy reliance on Ms. Sebald spotting her rapist five months afterward, the misidentification during the police lineup, the fact that Mr. Broadwater had passed two polygraph tests. They have a mountain of evidence. They reached out to William Fitzpatrick, who was the Onondaga County District Attorney, and he also very quickly realized this should not have happened. And so he joined those lawyers, Hammond and Schwartz, in their motion to overturn Mr. Broadwater's conviction. He also noted that he called it a handful of years ago. He had instructed his staff to review cases that used hair comparison to see if they needed to be overturned or reexamined. And he did make a note that Mr. Broadwater's case never actually came up during that investigation. Very curious. 
Yes. But as soon as that evidence was presented, Mr. Broadwater was very, very quickly exonerated. There is a very moving picture in the New York Times coverage of him at the moment of his exoneration with his head in his hands, you know, crying. What a relief that must have been for him. But also, I'm sure a sense of bittersweetness that he had lived with this for over 40 years, 16 years of which were spent in jail. Now, I remember when the story first broke, because I had read Lucky at that point, I was very interested in the fact that the book that I had read that had been so, I'm not going to say touching because it's not touching, it's disturbing, but I had read it, it had made an impact on me. So I was very interested in the fact that this had just happened. I think I, along with the rest of America who were invested in this case, waited with bated breath to see if Alice Sebald was going to offer an apology to Mr. Broadwater. It took a little bit for it to happen. I remember just paging through my news feed every day going, is she going to apologize? Is she going to make a statement? Like, what's going to happen here? So she did know a couple of weeks ahead of the hearing date that the case was being reevaluated. So she, she did know ahead of time, but she had to wait a couple of days after the exoneration to make a statement. Uh, I imagine she was probably trying to figure out how to say what she needed to say. I imagine probably some publicists were involved with this as well. I'll go ahead and and quote from a portion of her statement here. Um, There is much more to it. Quote, it's hard to unravel a truth I now know to be false and that has been part of my life for 40 years and my work for 20 without my whole understanding of truth and justice falling apart. Every word I've read that Anthony Broadwater has said has made me see him as a man who, though brutalized, somehow came through it with a generous heart. To go from thinking he was the man who raped me to believing he was an innocent victim is an earth-shattering change. She had also made an earlier statement to Medium, and I'll quote from that as well. Ms. Sebald said that her goal in 1982 was justice, not to perpetuate injustice and that she is now wrestling with the realization that her rapist walked free. She added that Mr. Broadwater was another young Black man brutalized by our flawed legal system. I am sorry, most of all, for the fact that the life you could have led was unjustly robbed from you. Very powerful. Very much so. Very much so. As I mentioned at the top of the pod, Scribner has ceased all distribution of Lucky. They are working with Ms. Sebald to figure out, can it be revised? It should be revised, absolutely. But they are trying to figure out how. How do we revise this to reflect what has happened? They may even actually be considering whether or not it's possible for her to do the work that it would take to revise this. I don't mean physically, I mean emotionally. I think it would be extraordinarily difficult I think that she should try to do it, absolutely. But I can't imagine the kind of energy and strength that it would take to be able to do that. A number of people have spoken out in the press basically saying, look, what a horrible thing she did. This is terrible. I can't believe she did that to this man. Other people have said, look, it was a genuine, honest mistake. This is not something that she set out to do. Mr. Mucciante has referred to Mr. Broadwater as a modern day Emmett Till. That is a comparison I know that has come up in some of the reporting as well. One of Ms. Sebald's former professors, Tobias Wolf, an author, uh, has said that that thing should have so defined her life and her art, and now it comes back into her life yet again. My heart really goes out to her. It has got to be tough thinking that you have gone through the work to put something past you and then realize you haven't put it past you. In fact, you've made a massive mistake in trying to put it past you. That's, that's got to be difficult. My heart really does go out to her. And in fact, Mr. Broadwater has said that he empathizes with Miss Sebald as well. He says of her statement, her apology, that was very strong and courageous of her to do. I know that was weighing on her mind. She went through an ordeal and I went through one too. At the moment, Mr. Broadwater is seeking financial restitution from the state and he is considering filing a federal civil rights lawsuit. The production of Lucky has been halted, but a documentary about Mr. Broadwater called Unlucky is now being spearheaded by Mr. Mucciante, Scott Rosenbaum, and Anthony Gracia with the film production company Red Hawk Films. So I think we can look forward to that here in the coming coming months. 
It's a heck of a case, although it ultimately has a very satisfying conclusion. Mr. Broadwater was exonerated. My heart really does go out to both of them as they have worked through this horrible ordeal that both have gone through. One thing that's incredibly striking is Mr. Broadwater's grace in accepting Al Sebold's apology, this 18-year-old woman whose testimony deprived him of his freedom for 16 years and has largely defined his life since then. His level of grace and acceptance of her apology is very striking. Yeah, agreed. That's what stood out to me more than anything else. And we'll keep you updated on any developments in this case as it moves forward. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>